in the Washington Post of this morning, Friday, November 13th. Turkey muzzles democracy's watchdogs. Now, notice the charge here from Ganom is not that Erdogan is really the caliph of ISIS or that his son is part of the oil smuggling operation, which is now in trouble because that that road is exactly where those trucks had to go. The oil is not in Raqqa. The oil is over there in Mosul. So the supply line goes both ways. Anyway, Ganom... Turkey muzzles democracy's watchdog. So this is essentially the story of how the uh, you know the Erdogan Erdogan government and Davutoglu are crushing uh, the opposition. This is the classic limited hangout, classic limited hangout people. In the sense, I if I say you know Stalin beats his dog, I've really said something good about him, right? Because the crimes are much greater. And over here, if you say, oh, Erdogan, you're mean to the journalists. Wait a minute. You're the caliph of the ISIS state and your children work for it. And you're the kingpin of this entire thing. So if, if, if all I say is Ganom, Ganom writing together with Christopher Delois, Delois, Secretary General of Reporters Without Borders. See, this is all about reporters. What about the fact that without those Turkish supplies, ISIS could not exist. That's exactly what a limited hangout is. So congratulations to Gnome for another limited hangout, but I'm sorry, we're not going to fall for it. Uh, this is actually, this is running interference for Erdogan. Gnome Chomsky runs interference for Erdogan. There you see it, right there, by being silent about what he really does what Erdogan really does, okay? So that's a very serious matter. Now let's run down a couple of other aspects to the entire thing. There is this strange atmosphere of uh, intrigue in the Pentagon, and I don't know what this is, but I do know that the timing is significant. In other words, this is now a watershed, right? The, the Free Sinjar, Operation Free Sinjar, the offensive, that's a phase change in the entire thing. And at this point, Ashton Carter fires the lieutenant general, who was his principal military aide, back in radio Webster Carter here in Washington, D.C. And my, my last item of the um, previous segment was Ashton Carter, right, the utopian pedant, somebody who I don't think is too happy with the fall of Sinjar and the humiliation of ISIS and the collapse now of their myth of invincibility and invulnerability. Ashton Carter on Thursday, the first day of this new offensive, has fired Army Lieutenant General Ron Lewis from his post as senior military advisor to the Secretary of Defense and has said that this case will now be given to the Inspector General of the Pentagon to determine the facts, and the Department of the Army will then uh, act uh, accordingly. This guy, Ron, Lieutenant General Ron Lewis of the Army, is one of relatively few uh, black generals. Right, The Army has about 310, 320 generals somewhere in there, and not so many are black. He's the only one from the Chicago area, as we as we learn. Now, the Washington Post, citing an insider, says the dismissal involved an alleged improper relationship. What does that mean? With a woman, with a spy, with somebody else, right? What does that mean? Uh, watch out, because remember, when they want to get rid of you for political reasons, like Petraeus, like Allen, for that matter, um, and this, this is whether you're good, bad, or indifferent. They generally don't do it on the political issue involved, but they, they get you on either uh, sex or money, right? Embezzlement, stuff like this, expense account uh, fraud or, or what have you. So um, let's look at this I I entire situation now. Um, the other uh, news, of course, is there was a large bomb in southern Beirut in a Shiite area thought to be friendly to Hezbollah. So 50 dead about and 200 wounded. So that would be a retaliation by ISIS, who claim responsibility, or some ally of ISIS, uh, attacking 
Hezbollah, and Hezbollah has done yeoman service, right, indispensable role in helping the the uh, Syrian Arab army to fight ISIS and other terrorists. Uh, there is a battle going on in the Turkish city of Silvan, that's in southeast Anatolia, and that's the Turkish army against the PKK, and that's been going on for a week or so. I believe I already mentioned the Iraqi army is besieging <clears throat> Ramadi and will soon have encircled that area. The ISIS terrorists will be boxed in. Um, hats off to the Syrian Arab army. They have now lifted the siege of Kuwaitis, uh, Kuwaitis Air Base. Uh, so that confirms that's the second or third significant milestone of the Syrian Arab army. And of course, congratulations to the Russian uh, airstrikes that have made that uh, possible. Um, we've also got, oh, the U.S. now claims to have killed Jihadi John, and that would be this character that we've seen in the beheading films, right? There are a lot of questions about these, right? We can't get into all that stuff, but uh, whatever they were, this guy seems to have been in them, and the word this morning is that a U.S. drone has killed Jihadi John, British terrorist in uh, in in Syria. Um, the Israelis have carried out airstrikes against Syrian territory, and it is thought, in particular, against it, parts of Syrian territory where Hezbollah is uh, present. Now. And I think that's those are some of the some of the principal things that are uh, going on. Uh, Putin, uh, President Putin of Russia, says the Russians are announcing for the last two days 107 sorties and 289 targets. And I think this is precisely the kind of emulation you need, right? If you don't keep pace, you will lose face. So now the U.S. has finally done something. So we're hoping maybe Russia will at this point say. Yes, indeed. Why don't we interdict that infamous uh, Jarablus to Efren uh, corridor? I would, I would call on President Putin at this point to do that. I would say that uh, the Russian interest and the, the human interest of humanity would be well served by having Russia get to work on interdicting those supply lines, because that's the whole ball game right there. If you interdict those then ISIS collapses just about everywhere. Putin now says that Russia <clears throat> is willing to work together with anybody. They've been working together with the Free Syrian Army. They've gotten uh, target information from the Free Syrian Army telling them where ISIS is, and some of that they have acted on. And he points to the fact that the U.S. has been uh, slow to act, and that's certainly true. But now, Allen is out. So I think the U.S. is on, at least on the way, has made a first step towards redeeming the national honor of the United States from this shameful, horrendous phase of appeasement and phony war imposed by Petraeus and Allen and their networks, right? Some of those guys have to be fired. Now, they have not given up. Above all, Allen has not given up. We have a, an interview with Alan here, uh, this is uh, this uh, charming lady, Elise Labatt, uh, the CNN uh, editor who usually, you know, she travels with Hillary and stuff like this. So the hallmark of the Allen networks, of the appeasement, phony war, and I would say treason networks, is that they've got to be very pessimistic. Man, Sinjar falls in 24 hours. They can say, well, maybe we can roll up ISIS within a couple of weeks. Why not? Yeah, there are some booby traps, but who cares? Mop them up, right? Leave some other troops to do that and send the elite guys on to the next attack. All right, so they're mopping up. But uh, so we have Alan coming out saying, uh, if we... If we, it's what he's essentially, he doesn't come out and say it, but he wants to bomb Assad. He wants to bomb Assad. So he says the following, if we don't get at those issues over the long term, not just be compelled to constantly fight, to be fighting 
The symptoms of the problem, see, the problem is really Assad and ISIS is a symptom is what he thinks, which is the symptoms of the problem, problems, which is, I think, are Al-Qaeda and which is, no, which is Al-Qaeda and which is Daesh. If we don't get to the left of those symptoms and try to solve these underlying circumstances, working collaboratively with those who are in the region, who best understand the region, then we're going to be condemned to fight forever. So Sinjar falls in 24 hours. Allen tells CNN, we're going to have to fight forever. Are we nuts? Are we insane? And this poor woman, of course, never, uh, she never says anything uh, to contradict him. Also, um, Allen loves the Saudis. He doesn't say anything about the fact that the Saudis are the ones who sent in all the killers and the butchers to begin with. He says the Saudis have been very aggressive in providing support on a humanitarian level. Man, even Bernie Sanders could not have topped that. He, uh, Allen also loves the Emiratis. Allen would love to have a no-fly zone over Syria, but the time is not right anymore. The time is no longer right. And um, what else does he say? Uh, Allen also tries to repeat this idiotic legend that there was this wonderful time in the early spring of 2011 when there were peaceful demonstrations. And if only Assad had opened his eyes to those wonderful peaceful demonstrators, then we could have had a peaceful solution. This is a big lie. This is insane. There's been a violent Muslim Brotherhood, CIA, MI6-backed opposition against the Syrian government since the early 1980s, at the at the latest, sir, in the big massacre. There never was a nonviolent phase. Those demonstrators had firearms from the word go. And we'll be back in a minute. Mr. Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> now, the idea, therefore, is you can tell the agents now, because anybody who's honest and reality-oriented would say, hey, the fall of Sinjar means that ISIS is a paper tiger. Let's destroy them quickly right now. Why should people have to stay under ISIS control until the springtime? The people in the Allen Petraeus side of things come out and say, like Allen, Allen says, we could be at war, quote, forever, unquote, forever. ISIS is forever. A diamond may not be forever, but ISIS is forever, says General Allen of the Marine Corps. Oh, I forgot to mention, Allen wants to be Secretary of State. Can you believe it? He wants to be rewarded for his sabotage by being on the list, right? He's always willing to come back and, uh, and do something for the country. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, God help us. Don't let Allen become... Secretary of State, right? Maybe he already sees that there's something going on with uh, with uh, Ash Carter and his military aide there. Right? We still don't know what that is. So uh, we've got another guy, the uh, this character Bowman, I think, from the National Public Radio. He says the people that he's talking to, Alan Cleek, I suppose, they're all pessimistic. It's going to take three years to get to Mosul. To get from Sinjar to Mosul, it's less than 100 miles, at least from my viewing of the map, right? You drive down the road, right? You push these ISIS clowns aside. Three years. How can anybody make such a, an estimate, right? What would go into making that estimate? Quite apart from the fact that it's crazy. Um, you, can, you could put paratroopers in there in two days, not, not three years. Uh, and then, of course, we've got uh, uh, just here in Washington, right, the, the congressmen all listen, oh, listen to this. They want to know about the traffic on the way home. WTOP, they say it's going to take years of war to defeat ISIS. And other people say, no, decades of war. This is all absolute insanity. Uh, and fortunately, it looks like things are, are lining up so that ISIS can be uh, can be crushed. So let's um, also point out uh, Russia has installed the S-400 Growler surface-to-air missile system, quite capable. Goes up to 90,000 feet and goes 
a hundred miles out, I guess it is, or something like that, in various directions. The British are afraid that the Royal Air Force Base on Cyprus, that is to say, Akrotiri, the British have sovereign bases still on 